<laughs> Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 13. Lord, thank you so much as we turn to Proverbs 13. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your goodness. It is your breath in our lungs. And that gives us the desire and the willingness to praise you. So we thank you for your goodness. Speak to us tonight through the book of Proverbs. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 13, and as you're turning there, we're reminded that these next several chapters that we've been going through, and I think up until chapter 14, these are called antithetical writings. That's just a fancy word. Antithetical, antithetical is just a fancy word for just describing their contrasting. Contrasting. So tonight in Proverbs 13, we're going to see the contrast clearly between the righteous and the foolish. That's going to be our contrast tonight in our antithetical writing tonight by Solomon. And so he gives us these examples as we've clearly seen the contrast. We see the right and wrong of the point that Solomon is trying to make. And it makes it easier for us to understand. And so that's why the Lord allowed Solomon to, to use this sort of style of writing to kind of drive a point home. And we've been seeing that in the last several chapters. I believe we picked up this sort of style of writing in chapter 11. We saw it in chapter 12, and now tonight we'll see it in 13, and, 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 and I believe in 14, chapter 14, likewise, as the Lord tarries. But let's pick up for tonight in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 1. And right away we start with our contrast. A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So we see these contrasts, the wise and the scoffer. In other words, someone that scoffs, someone, someone that just blows off instruction. But a wise one is listening and desiring to be taught. So we see the contrast right away. Verse 2. A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. So once again, a man will eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the unfaithful can only count on violence. That's a rough way to live, and I know a lot of us lived that way for a period of time. It's no fun. He who guards his mouth... In this same regard, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Years ago, and, um, and this was a long time ago, believe me, but I was coming home. It was late in the afternoon. I was beat up. I was tired. That's not an excuse. Uh, it just makes me look even more foolish. But I was pulling into a gas station in Corona, and um, something went on. You know how it goes when you're on the freeway and in the gas station and things. You know, this guy's doing this and you're doing that and the other thing. And before you know it, everybody's like, bah, 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 you know. And so I kind of lost my mind for a split second. And I said something really brilliant, you know, out the window, really brilliant. And right when it came out, the Lord said, okay, Greg, now go ahead and go over and witness to that guy. And I said, well, I can't. And the silence of the Lord was deafening. And I knew what he was saying was, was no kidding. You can't witness to him now. So was that all worth it? Was that, that two and a half seconds of blowing off steam worth it? And I'll tell you, that changed my life. I then quit opening my mouth wide. I really did. That was a turn point moment in my life. And I'm glad for that. And I use that as a reference often. I, I know I've used it at this church several times. But it meant a lot to me because it changed my attitude. I now button my lip. It's not worth it. I mean, is that guy going to hell? Well, more than likely because the road to, the, to hell is wide. And so yet I'm yelling at him, shaking my fist. And I'm a born-again guy. And yet, I mean, I, I never forget about that. Yeah, go witness to him. Well, I can't. Duh. You know, one of those moments. It's like, man, what's the matter with me? So I just drove off, you know. And, uh, what, is, what is my problem, you know? I mean, was that really that big of a deal? 
Well, of course it wasn't. You know, when we review, it was, that was just stupid. That was my, my foolish pride and such. So I want to guard my mouth, and I want to preserve life in that regard. The, the soul of a lazy man desires, yet he has nothing. Isn't that amazing? The lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Oh, please, body of Christ, family members, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley, remain diligent in your life. Remain diligent and let the Lord bless. Amen? Verse 5, a righteous man hates lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and comes to shame. Loathsome. It means drawing disgust. When someone's loathsome, when you say, man, that, that thing really, that, that, that person is really loathsome, it means that they are generating disgust out of, out of the beholder. When I behold something that is loathsome, it draws disgust into my mind. And that's what the Lord is saying here. The wicked man is loathsome. And the Lord is saying, really, through Solomon, you know, I, disgust is being drawn out of me as I look at the wicked person. I mean, this is the Lord speaking. Oh, God loves all of us and this and that and the other thing. Sure he does, but you know what? He's also holy. And he's God. And he will not put up with evilness, evil doing. That's loathsome to him. It bubbles up disgust in his thoughts. In, in, his, in his thought pattern. It's amazing when, when we read verses like this, how the Lord has, expresses certain things. Hey, I don't like that. And I'm wanting to let you know that. And I've not hidden it. I've written it in my word so you can study it and consider it. And so God is very good in that regard. So the righteous man hates lying, but, but, the, but a wicked man is loathsome. And he will eventually come to shame. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless. But wickedness overthrows the sinner. Eventually all those that blaspheme the Lord, they will come to their end. So don't get impatient or don't get mad or don't do like I did at the shell station and go, hey, that's you. It's not necessary. God doesn't need me to help him out that way. He doesn't need that. He'll handle it. <laughs> but the wicked, wickedness overthrows the sinner. So we're seeing these contrasts. Verse 7, there is one who makes himself rich. And the idea is here, there's one that makes himself rich materially, yet has nothing. What comes to my mind is Scrooge. Right? Scrooge had every material thing you could imagine. And yet he had nothing. He had nothing. He had no family. He had no relationships. You know, he, had, he lived a cold, dark life, if you will. I mean, he's a fictitious character, but that's the, the first thing that came into my mind was Scrooge. I mean, he, he thought he had everything. Well, he, he had a lot materially, yes. But the Lord is saying he has nothing. That sort of attitude creates nothing. Yet one who makes himself poor can have great riches. I mean, the blessings of the Lord. And that's why we don't have a lot of patience when we're flipping the channels around and the guy says on there, oh, you can get rich quick by just doing this. We just turn the channel. Because we know that we're rich in Christ. And that's the first priority. After that, how God wants to provide for us is totally up to him. But we're grateful. So we, the world may look at you and I as poor people, which I know that's not true because of our fellowship and our relationship. The world might look at us like having nothing, but really we have everything. We have life. And when we speak about that life that we have through Jesus Christ, people don't want to hear about it because they know that they're really miserable. We're going to take a little bit of a look at that come Sunday as the Lord tarries.
And that's why people want to shut us down because they really know that they're lonely and they, their lives are just disasters, but they don't want to be reminded of it. We can relate to that. We self-medicated, a lot of us, for a while because we didn't like what we saw in the mirror. And we didn't want to hear and see other things going on. So we can relate to a degree. So we've got to be a little careful as we relate to others now that we're in our born-again condition. So we've got to be careful. We've got to give compassion. That's not a natural thing for us. So we've got to allow the, God the Holy Spirit really to work through us. He's working in us. Now let's let him work through us. Amen? And so understand, one that, that thinks he's rich materially is really broken. And you know, half the time I think those folks know it better than we do, that they're broken. We have made ourselves poor. We have given ourselves to one another, and we have great riches right here in this room to start with. And that's a great thing. In that line, in verse 8, in that kind of theme, I should say, the ransom of a man's life is his riches. I mean, what's, how much is a rich man willing to give when he gets kidnapped? Well, he's willing to give a bunch of his material so he can be freed. But you and I, I mean, we don't get robbed because we're poor. <laughs> you know, I bought the, you know, these shoes are $30 shoes I'm wearing, you know, and they're half wore out. So there's not a lot of value on me. You know, you can have all my cash, you know, I, I'm a pretty good tipper, you know, and stuff, but gee, you know, poor people don't get robbed. <laughs> Wealthy people get kidnapped. You know, the, 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 the poor, in the second part of verse 8, the poor does not hear rebuke. Uh, what, what it's, the idea here is that the poor are not even threatened. They're not threatened. But man, what does it say when you've got to have bodyguards you know, following you around? I mean, what kind of a life is that? And people still get shot. And, you know, that kid just got killed the other, you know, the other day. And he's got two bodyguards that actually just bolted from either side when the, when the gunfire started going off. I mean, that's, that's a tragedy, and I'm not trying to be funny or anything, but my goodness, you know, a ransom of a man's life is his riches. You become a target when you have wealth. You become a target. And so we need to be careful. The light of the righteous rejoices, verse 9, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. That's scary stuff. So be patient and compassionate with those people that are really getting under your skin. Really ask the Lord to refresh you in that compassion department because their, their lamp will be put out and sooner than we even think. By pride comes nothing but strife. But, and here's the contrast, with the well-advised is wisdom. With the well-advised, there is wisdom. Iron, sharpening iron. In the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. So we know these things. So let's walk confidently in that. The well in the, with the well-advised is wisdom. Verse 11, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished... But he who gathers by labor will increase. I mean, wealth gained by dishonesty or wealth gained very quickly is not taken care of. It's used casually. A easy come, easy go, that old saying says. But when we gather by labor, man, when our hands have blisters on our, on our palms and things like that, we think twice about just throwing cash around, don't we? Because we worked hard for that money. And so we even stash away a little bit. And before you know it, we've got a little stash of money that, that we can use for whatever the, the Lord has for us. But he who gathers by labor will increase. Because they appreciate that money. It came at a price. And it's worth it. This is an amazing verse to me. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. When there's hopelessness in a life... That's exactly where it ends, is in a hopeless condition. That's terrible. Hopelessness makes the heart sick, but when desire comes, when desire returns, when desire comes, it is a tree of life. 
the theme for the ladies weekend last weekend was rooted that tree that healthy tree rooted deeply getting those nutrients and such so hopelessness is a red flag if you know someone that is drifting into that idea of hopelessness man you got to pray and allow the Lord to guide you and pray over that friend that that family member that acquaintance whatever the case may be hopelessness is we don't want to leave people in, in their hopeless condition we've all got stories and I've got way too many of friends that were in hopeless conditions that I wish were here today so hope deferred, hope deferred, a lack of hope makes the heart sick. So be very careful with that. Verse 13, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. That's a mouthful. We remember the psalmist told us as we were going through the Psalms, in Psalm 119, the psalmist asked a rhetorical question, if you will, how can a young man cleanse his way? Then, of course, he answers his own question by saying, by responding, well, by taking heed to your word, Lord. That's how me, the young man, cleanses my way. I take heed. So those who despise the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Continue to have your devotionals. Continue to have your Bible time. Continue to keep that pocket knife in your, in your pocket. On my motorcycle riding vest, I have that little pocket knife that I pull out now and again. Ooh, all right. And I stick it back in there. I'm ready to go. Now some of you guys have some big swords, man. I'm like, whoa. Check it out. <laughs> but that's the thing. Stay in the word, man. Stay in the word. That's the bottom line. It's great. Furthermore, again, in that kind of theme, the law of the wise is a fountain of life. To turn one away from the snares of death. Man, we want to know. We want to know how to stay away from the snares of death. We don't want to live foolishly. We've already done that. We're finished with that. So we want to be wise in, with the fountain, in the fountain of life, in the word, is the bottom line that Solomon's telling us here. Verse 15, good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. Furthermore, every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his folly. So we want to walk circumspectly. We want to walk in a, in a fashion of self-control. One of the fruits of the Spirit. We want to be guided by God the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, a wicked messenger falls into trouble. But a faithful ambassador, an ambassador is again just a fancy name for a representative. So a faithful representative brings health. When someone comes and says, hey, I've got a message from so-and-so, you want to make sure they're a faithful representative, a faithful ambassador. So the one receiving the message from, from your messenger is going to deliver it well and bring good health. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, shrugs off, shrugs off correction poverty and shame will come to him who shrugs off correction ignores correction but he who regards a rebuke will be honored we'll see later on that Solomon suggests hey rebuke or in other words correct a wise man and he'll receive it and the result will be he'll become even wiser He'll become wiser. So a wise man wants corrective criticism, if you will. And a wise man will look at it and say, okay, is this worthy? Is this something I need to consider? Hmm, yeah, hey, it may be. I think it is. And then he'll say, hey, thanks. I'm going to apply that. I appreciate you telling me that. So a wise man will become wiser. A, 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 a wise man who regards a rebuke will be honored. 
you'll be honored to receive that. I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't know I did that. I don't want to do that anymore. Thank you. That was an honorable thing to do. You know, it's like when we let our friend that's got that piece of spaghetti on his, on his cheek, you know, walk into the party and we saw it the whole time, but we didn't say anything. You know, I said, I, I would have rather, you know, I would have rather you corrected me, you know, is what they said after they went through and met 50 people. I said, well, I didn't want to embarrass you. I said, well, oh, no, you embarrassed me mightily. And that's, but that's what the, the wise man says, hey, I want to get corrected because I wasn't aware that that was going on. I wasn't aware of that ling linguine on my, my, my cheek. He should have just said something or at least reached over and, you know, brushed it off. So rebuke the, the wise man. He'll receive that. Verse 19, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. Isn't that great when we can look at our lawn after we just made the last pass and it's Friday afternoon and it's like all done? And we just look at it and say, man, that's sweet. Now I'm going to goof off. Let's go get a pizza. <laughs> A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Isn't that amazing? But how long did we run from the Lord or reject his still small voice as we were trying to do our thing? We were foolish. It was an abomination to, to get out of our lifestyle. I mean, I look back on that now, I say, how foolish, and then I realize, man, Lord, I should have died five or six different times, and I'm not exaggerating. I'm thinking, my goodness, what a fool I was when the Lord kept asking me, asking me, would you depart from foolishness, from evil? And, oh, no, I like what I'm doing. What's the matter with you? You know, St. Peter's up there said, hey, Lord, I'll just zap him right now, no problem. I'll take him out. No, I'm going to use him, Peter. He's like, what? <laughs> huh? That's what I said, too, when the Lord says, I'm going to use you. I said, what? <laughs> huh? You were just merciful enough to let me live, let alone, you know, breathe a word of, of your goodness. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'm only commenting. <laughs> I love it. It's great. I mean, that's our Lord. That's God. He, he's so good to us. I mean, to us. Society's rejects. He brought us in. Hey, I love you. What? It took us years to figure this out. I mean, I'm, you know, we're, we're born again walking with the Lord, but man, this whole love thing, I'm not quite sure about it. I got to get used to it. But God was patient, and the body of Christ was patient, right? You kidding me? You should have saw me when I first walked into this church 25 years ago. Everybody else left. <laughs> You guys came in and filled their spaces. They said, man, Pastor Jim must be lost his mind. Brought this kid in. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Good stuff. That's our Lord. I, I blame the Lord. <laughs> he who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. That's, that's a promise. God. These are promises. Companion of fools, you'll be destroyed. You can get out of that, that group of folks, but as long as you remain there, you'll be destroyed. Evil pursues sinners, but the righteous, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Man, that's comforting, isn't it? So stay and remain diligent, as we talked about a couple minutes ago. Stay in your lane. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I mean, not only thinking of his kids, but also thinking a generation beyond his own kids. I mean, I want to bless my children, but then he's, but grandpa's always look, also looking at the grandkids. Say, hey, what can we kind of do for the grandkids? How can we bless them likewise? That's an important thing. A good man considers those things. But the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous. Man, the sinner and the wicked are just fighting a losing battle here. For us born again believers, it gets nothing but better. And that's why I like to say, hey, all this and heaven too. 
And that puts it into perspective for us. We go, yeah, that's right. Praise the Lord. Furthermore, in verse 23, much food is in the fallow ground of the poor, and for lack of justice, there is waste. Solomon is saying each man has a little bit of a lot in life. And here it's, it's speaking about the little piece of ground that maybe even a poor man has. But because of injustice or ignorance possibly, not knowing how to farm the land. And remember that back in Solomon's days, uh, agriculture was everything. I mean, if your crop didn't come up, you weren't eaten. Period. You know, it wasn't, you know, let's run down to Walmart and get a couple of cans of beans. You know, if, if you didn't plant your crop correctly, you're going hungry, man. And so Solomon is saying there's much potential in every man's little plot, whether it's 50 acres or whether it's one acre. But because of ignorance or undesire to learn how to plant that crop, there's waste. I mean, that, that piece of property has potential, but because of ignorance, it's not being tilled. It's not, it's not producing, that land is not producing what it could produce because of injustice, because someone wasn't trained or someone didn't represent something well, whatever the case may be. But again, Solomon is just observing. I see this. I've seen what's happening. And Solomon is saying, this is a tragedy. This is not good. And so he was jotting it down for people to, to recognize and to learn and to perhaps continue and to, to pick up the mantle of teaching. Hey, I want to teach you how to farm this patch of land so you can provide. Uh, so in our day and age, I want to teach you a trade. I want to teach you how to make something with your hands. So you can go to Walmart and buy a couple of cans of beans. But if you don't do anything, you're going to go hungry, man. And that's an injustice, Solomon is coming to that conclusion. That's wrong. He doesn't want to see this happening. So he's making a note of it, saying, hey, I want people's attention to look at this, and then we've got to come up with some ideas how to correct this, is what he's doing. Verse 24 and 25, as we close, he who spares the rod hates his son. You want your child just to go crazy? Let them do whatever they want. You know, imagine, you know, you've seen those six-year-olds bouncing off the hallway walls at the house. They're doing whatever they want. No good. We don't allow that sort of things in our homes. He who spares the rod hates his son, and once you introduce the rod to your son, after the second time, they, they got it. They're learning. Say, okay, I, I can dig it, pops. Yeah, that's all. I'm not mad at you. You know? But I need to get your attention. And that's all it's saying here. Hey, don't spare the rod. But he who loves his child disciplines him promptly because they don't want him to go astray. They want him to, to learn, to understand. Hey, I want you to grow up to be a decent citizen. You know, don't be like me. <laughs> you know, I'm just kidding. But we, we again, self-control. Now, I know there's a lot of people that share this story. There were times in my house that I'll tell you, like every other day in my house, Probably you'd come and visit and think, gee, there's some major child abuse going on here. But we didn't see it that way. You know, my folks didn't know any better. You know, they didn't know any different, I should say. But yeah, there were some pretty radical things. And I, you know, we've shared some coffees together. And, and I know that, you know, back when, things were different. But we can't go to the other extreme today and say, oh, no, no. <gasps> oh. You know, I mean, that's where we're at, right? Oh, time out time. Oh, does mommy need a time out too? Huh? You know, you know grandpa's in the back going, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, so, but we get it. We get it. You know, discipline the children because you love them. We love our kids. We love our grandkids. So we correct them. <laughs> 
God help us. Finally, thank God. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. The, the, the righteous eats to the satisfying of his soul. I mean, it's like, man, this is a great day today. And you sit down and have a great meal. It's like, man, this is wonderful. But the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. Again, the differences and the contrast between the righteous yay, and the wicked. Mm. But again, the Lord's saying, you choose, but I'll meet you right wherever you're at. If I could ask the worship team to come join me. Once again, just a friendly reminder, we're entering into what we like to call Passion Week. I just love it. It just helps me reflect and just, you know, passion. I mean, the passion of Jesus Christ, his passion for you and I. And that's what we're entering into. And so Palm Sunday, this coming Sunday, we will be in Luke chapter 19. And we'll kind of hang around in Luke 19 for a couple of studies in a row. But just read ahead. Luke has a great way of describing these last days of Jesus. And so again, we'll spend some time with Luke and of course, be drawn to the Jesus. So read ahead. In the meantime, join us by standing. If you need prayer, come forward. We'll have some folks here who would love to embrace you and spend some time with you and pray with you. But in the meantime, remember, our God is greater. Amen. Hi everybody, Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we wanna challenge you, why not share these videos. You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.